continuing in our series, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. You know, I've been teaching for the past few weeks on prayer and, and how the disciples saw that Jesus' prayer life was essential and that they needed what he was doing. So because as Jesus, and you'll find this in Luke chapter 11, as Jesus came down from a certain place as he had been praying, and so when the, the, he came down, the disciples asked him, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And we need to learn to pray. Now, um, on last week, I taught you pray in Jesus' name. On the week before that, we talked about, you know, uh, uh, prayer and prayer and faith and knowing that God is your father and your loving, caring, sharing, heavenly father, and you can go to him. And, and for us in here, as people, we can't, we can't look at God like our earthly fathers. Even if you have a good earthly father. You know, we spoke of some men that are some good fathers in this earth. But then again, there, but there's so many bad examples. You know, I, I'm gonna say this very quickly. Uh, um, and some of us do have bad examples of fathers. I had terrible example of a father. My, my, my father didn't live with us. He didn't take care of us. Uh, come around every now and then. You know, and my mother had to work three jobs to, to just uh, uh, survive. But she did. She did. And I say, as for my dad, and he, it turned out that the man I called my dad, L.K. Harrison, who I, I, Harrison, I got the name Harrison from, found out that he wasn't my biological father anyway. Not mine. He was my brother and sister's father, but he wasn't mine. By then, he was out of the picture, and, and, and mom actually got with my biological father. But that man was in my life, but not as my father. I always thought of him as my godfather. He was in my life, and uh, he, as a teenager, he helped me work and showed me how to do things. And if I needed something, he'd come by the house. But I never knew that the man was my father. Never knew it. And with until, I think, last year, two years ago, I found out for sure, because my aunts had said, yeah, that man, Ava Richie, that's your dad. Uh, well, uh, no, my dad's F.K. Harrison. No, Ava Richie's your dad. Well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Until finally, you know, like, like I said, a year, two years ago, my, my youngest son did the uh, 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 ancestry uh, DNA thing, and we've been uh, doing DNA search and finding out family members. I got family members in Washington, D.C., Washington State, New York. I got, and I've been contacting some of these cousins. My wife uh, met some of her cousins she's never met before, and even some of her siblings that she didn't know. And so, because my son did the DNA thing, he found out. He said, Dad, the, the, the DNA ancestry thing says that your bloodline is Richie. I said, wow. He said, did you know a Richie? I said, yeah, I knew Mr. Abram Richie. He was, he was my godfather. No, he was more than your godfather. He was your dad. But this man was in my life in a positive way. But I never knew he was my father. So I said that to say this. When we're talking about the father God, don't, all, don't try to compare our Father God to your earthly fathers. Because none of them, no matter how good, and I considered myself a pretty good father. You think so, Tachi? I did. I was a pretty good father. Wasn't, wasn't the best, but you know what? Uh, I thought I did a pretty good job. But even that can't compare to the Father God. Can't compare. But today's lesson is on themes <clears throat> Is, 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 is Lord teach us to pray and things that hinder our prayers. Things that hinder our prayers. Because we need to know because a lot of people will, will come and I've talked to people who are unsaved and some that are saved said I pray but God don't seem to hear me. I, and, and In fact uh, uh, a few weeks ago Melinda gave her, her beautiful testimony and she said until she really broke down and cried out to the Lord she didn't think God was hearing her either, but he was hearing you. But there were some things we needed to understand. 
But there are things that hinder our prayers, ladies and gentlemen. And we need to know what these things are so we can avoid doing them. So we can avoid doing them. So we can channel our prayers in the right way. We already know we got to pray in faith. We already know we got to pray in Jesus' name. We learned that last week. We got to go to God and have confidence in him and the way that he said for us to go to him. But what do we do in our lives when we think God is not hearing us, when we think God is not answering our prayers? And we and, and something Susan Harrison and I always say, if God is not answering my prayers, what am I doing wrong? We always ask that question. What am I doing wrong? Am I being obedient? For those children in here, uh, us adults that have been children, and I've said this many times before, did your parents, no matter how good they were, did they bless you when you were disobedient? Did they give you what you wanted or let you go places and do things and have a good when you were disobedient? No, they didn't. So we need to know one of the hindrances to our prayers is our own disobedience. Our own attitudes sometimes, our own behaviors. And we're going to start with the first one um, because there, there are, are four different categories that we're going to talk about that hinders our prayers. And the first one is sin. It's sin. If you have your Bibles, go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 2. 2 Chronicles is in, the, in uh, actually chapter 7. 2 Chronicles is in the Old Testament. If you're uh, if you're in Psalms, just go right from Psalms and you'll 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 uh, not actually go left from Psalms, and you'll end up in, in Second Chronicles. Go left from Psalms, and you'll end up in Second Chronicles. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter seven, and this is a familiar verse of scripture that a lot of people quote when it's time to call people to prayer. In Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen, it says this. If my people, which are called by my name, and stop right here and look this way. First of all, God is talking through the prophet to his people. So we that are Christians, we that are born again, we that know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, and know God as our Father and Jesus as our elder brother, he's saying, if you, my people, who are called by my name, will do what? He said, humble yourselves and pray. So God wants us to pray, but sometimes prayer takes humility. Prayer takes humility. I, I, you know, I was once one of those guys that was very proud. I would always lend a helping hand, but I never wanted anybody to help me. I, w I would always give to somebody that asked of me, but I never wanted to ask anybody for anything because I was too proud to receive. And one of my friends, a brother in the Lord, my brother Harry Brown, I'm going to call his name, because he ministered to me one time, and it was something simple. He needed a ride somewhere. I gave him a ride, and then after he 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 and he stopped, and we stopped and got where he wanted to be. He turned around and he was going to give me five dollars for gas, and I said, "Harry, I don't want your money. Man, I didn't do this to get gas money or get paid. I did this because you're my brother and you needed my help." He said, "Well, I know you don't need the money. However," You're too proud. You need to learn to humble yourself. I said, I need to learn to humble myself. He says, yeah, you need to learn to humble yourself to receive. Because you're always giving. But you, and so that brother taught me a lesson in those few minutes that I needed to learn to humble myself to receive, even though I didn't need it. And there's times when I needed help, I wouldn't ask for help. I wouldn't ask for help. And so... The Bible is letting us know if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to pray. But there's, but as I said, sin hinders our prayers. He says, humble ourselves and pray. And look what he said, and seek his face. See, the Bible says in Matthew, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. All of what things? Everything you need. 
And then he says, when you seek his face, that you ask. You come to him, you ask. And you ask according to his will. And he hears you. So he says, now seek my face. And here's the kicker. And turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your wicked ways. Okay, are y'all still with me? Yes. To turn from your ways. If your ways are not God's ways, then you're going opposite of the way that God wants you to go. And, and, and should you expect to receive anything from God? Sin hinders your prayers. You see, and a, a guy told me one time, he said, I pray, I pray, I pray, but, but, but God seems like he's not hearing me. And I asked him, I asked him the same thing, the statement I made earlier. I said, you've got four children. I said, you're a pretty good dad. You work hard, you make money. I said, when your children are disobedient, do you bless them? Do you give them what they want? Do you let them go where they want? Do you buy them gifts? He said, no. I withhold that until they get in line. I said, guess what? Have you been obedient to God? And he said, oh, I got you, preacher. I got you. See, I had to show him him in the natural with his children for him to see God in the spiritual. How can we expect God to bless us if we're disobedient to God? If we being men, just like we learned last week, if we being sinful men in this sinful and adulterous generation will give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give good gifts to those that love him? However, the flip side of that, if we being men, we withhold things from our children when they're disobedient, when they're when they're wrong, when they're when they're uh, 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 not doing what they should be doing. How much more should God do the same? So sin will hinder our prayers. He said, "If you humble yourselves and pray, seek my face, and turn." from your wicked ways. And that's the essence of repentance. Stopping your sin, that sinful life that you're living. Stopping right where you are and turn toward God. That seeking his face. And turn from your wicked ways. He says, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will hear from heaven. It's not that God didn't hear your prayer. He heard your prayer. But he ain't obligated to you when you're in sin. And then, if you're not a child of God, I said this before, and it bears reiterating, then, then he's not obligated to you at all. He's not obligated to bless the devil's kids. Just as me, as a, as a, as a father, when my kids, uh, friends came over to the house, yeah, I'd give them, Mr. Harrison, will you give me some water? i give them some water. If they were hungry, yeah, I'd give them a bologna sandwich or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But were I obligated to house them, clothe them, feed them, and, and provide for them? No. I might bless them a little bit with a little something, but they're not mine. And neither are the devil's kids God's. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, if Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life, then God is not obligated to you. So don't get mad when you think you pray and you say, well, God ain't hearing me. No, he, don't, he hears you, but he ain't, he ain't paying in no mind because you're not his. But if you are his, if you are his, and then you're walking in disobedience, don't think you're going to get blessed. You know, I said it last week, and it very iterated, because it made me laugh when I said it, and I think a couple of people in the church laughed, you know, and, 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 you know, here you are being disobedient, mama saying, take out the trash, take out the trash. And then you come up to mama, you got a list of things you want mama to do for you and buy for you. She says, see that list? Put it in that trash you should have took out. See, when you disobedient, God ain't obligated to you. He's not obligated to bless you. So don't walk in disobedience. Sin is disobedience. He says, then he'll hear from heaven and heal your land. And verse 15, he says, now my eyes shall be open and my ears attentive unto the prayers that is made in this place. See, when you're walking in obedience, if you do what it said in verse 14, humble yourself, seek his face, turn from your wicked ways, 
and pray. See, I said last week, and it bears reiterating, God, for every promise God had, he has a standard and he has a condition. There's a standard and there's a condition. And when you don't meet the condition, do you, should you get the gift? Should you get the promise? No. That's why he said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, then you can ask what you will. See, but you've got to be in him. And his word got to be in you. Or your prayers are in vain. They're in vain. That's like going to somebody else's father and say, will you take care of me? I say, no. No. So sin. Sin. That's the first principle. I told you there were four and I'm going to try to stay in order. I'm going to try to stay in order. The second one is found in Matthew chapter 6 is in James chapter 4. Praying with the wrong motive. Praying with the wrong motive. Have you ever prayed with the wrong motive? And I'm going to show you that. And we studied on this. Matter of fact, uh, uh, this past Wednesday night in Bible study, we happened to come across this in James chapter 4. And we're going to, uh, once again, we're going to talk about this a little bit. But in Matthew chapter 6, Say amen when you get there. And look with me at verse 5. The scripture says, And when thou pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. Now what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is a play actor. Somebody who's claiming or playing like they're something that they're not. They're, they're a play actor. A hypocrite. So he said, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be phony. Don't be phony. Be for real. Be who you are. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the streets. That they may be, and this is the key, seen of men. For the wrong motives. They're praying to be seen. Now listen to me. It's all right to be seen praying. But don't pray to be seen. Just like the uh, 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 scripture after this or the, the thought after this, it's all right to be seen giving and doing good deeds. But don't do the good deeds and do the things to be seen. Because if you're doing it to be seen, then you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Your reward is that just what you were seeking, the, the attention and the glory of men. That's what he went on to say. Which, look with me at verse 6. He said, but thou wilt not pray, is enter into thy closet, and when thou shut the door, pray to your father in secret, that thou father which seeth in secret will reward you openly. Now, I, 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 I looked at that and I said, well, should we never pray in public? No, that's not what this scripture is saying. But you should have a private prayer life. You should have a time where you set apart and you seek God's face on a regular basis and that you go in and there's nobody else around and you're, and you're communing with your heavenly father. So if you're going to pray in public, you should always also have a private prayer life. Now, sometimes I literally, and y'all don't have to do this. No, we saw that, that movie War Room. She had a prayer closet. I literally sometimes when I just want to be alone and in the dark, I, I'll go in my closet in, 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 in my room and I'll, I'll put a towel down on the door so no light will come in and I'll shut the door and it's pitch dark in there and I'm talking to God. I'm talking to God. But it's not in a literal sense. It can be and there's nothing wrong with doing it in a literal sense. But he's saying, you go to God with your situation, with your problem, with your, with your request. Make your request known unto God. And when you pray to him privately, he'll also reward you openly. But don't pray with the wrong motives. Don't pray with the wrong motives. And there are sometimes people pray with the wrong motives. Verse 8, he says, Be not you therefore like unto them, for your father know what things you have need of before you even ask it. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the play actors. Don't be like, don't be phony. Don't 
Don't only run to God when you're in trouble or when you need something. And then, but you don't really plan to serve the Lord. You don't plan to obey the Lord. Now, a lot of people do that. Before I got saved and got into the word, I did that. And I told you all that before. I, man, I, I, I made one of those prayers. And I said, Lord, if you just bless me, if you'll just bless me, I'll serve you from here on out. And I didn't mean to keep that prayer. I was just trying to get what I want. It's just like some of, some of you kids sometimes, you'll tell your mom or your daddy or your uncle or your grandparents what they want to hear so they'll give you what they want, but you don't really plan to carry it out. You, you're really being deceitful. I see some witnesses in the house. I, I see some, 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 some smiling faces and some, some eyebrows raising up. Yeah, I've done that. I didn't really mean to keep my word. I just, I just wanted to get what I wanted to get. Or I just wanted to go where I wanted to go. And so I would tell mama anything just to, let her, just to get her to let me, let me go. To get her to let me use the car. To get, get her to uh, give me some money or whatever the case may be. You know, let me, let me go to the party or to the, to the dance at school or whatever it was. Whatever the case may be. God said, don't be like that. If you come at the limb, mean what you say and say what you mean. Mean what you say and say what you mean. Mm -hmm. Amen. The third principle is found in Luke chapter 18. Pride and selfish motives. Pride and 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 go with me to Luke chapter 18. And I'm gonna paraphrase this too for the most part because uh, it's from verse nine, 9 to verse 14. From verse 9 to verse 14. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. But it starts out and he says, and he spoke a parable. And he says, certain that trust, and watch this, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. Trusted in who? In themselves. Trusted in who? In themselves. In other words, their own self-worth. Their own self-worth. Or, or their selfishness. In other words, uh, 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 what benefited them only? Who trusted in themselves that they were were righteous and and despised others. See, that's why you know humility is so important. We can never think we're the big eyes and you're the little U's, because we're all the same in the eyesight of God, unless you're His child and someone else is not His child. Other than that, all of us who are saved, you know, I like in my house. My, my, my children, and they still do this, and they're, they're, they're in their late 30s and, 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 and uh, mid 40s. My children age from their late 30s to their mid 40s, and they still saying, I'm dad's favorite. I'm, I'm dad's favorite. You know, and I say, well, no, none of y'all are my favorite, all of them, and then all of y'all are my favorite. You know, but obedience will, will retract favor. In other words, when you're obedient and you're doing what you're supposed to do, you get the favor of your parent. When my children were growing up, uh, when they were young, and even to this day, when they do what I tell them to do, they have my favor. Even when I was a teacher at the high school, when I, uh, when I was a coach at the junior high and high school, uh, you know, I didn't favor any player. But when a player performed, when he performed and practiced hard, I gave him favor. It's not that he was my favorite. I gave him favor because he was obedient. My students in school, you know, sometimes y'all think, well, that teacher don't like me. No, no teacher comes to class, and I had to explain this to one of my children one time. No teacher comes to the school in the first of the year and say, I like that one, I don't like that one. I like that one, and I don't like that one. That's not what they do. Your behavior dictates to that teacher how they're going to give you favor or give you punishment. Your behavior. 
If you come in that class and you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're, you're not talking when you shouldn't be talking, you're bringing your material and you're doing your lessons, you're turning in your work, you're raising your hand, you're asking questions and you're doing the things right, well, that teacher's going to give you favor. Because when you want to do something, that teacher say, well, yeah, I can trust this student because they're always obedient. And so that, oh, you're the teacher's pet. And so everybody jones on that student. No, that teacher, that student just got the teacher's favor because they were obedient. But the one that's always resisting, always talking back, never bringing in their stuff, always talking to somebody else when class is going on, passing notes, or, or sleeping in class. And then they ask the teacher, well, can I go to the bathroom? No, because I can't trust you in the hall. So that's how I was as a teacher. So if you were if you was that kind of student that that disrupted class and did all that kind of stuff, wasn't obedient, didn't always bring your stuff, you know, you didn't have my favor. And don't get mad at the student that got my favor because I have no favorites, but those but I favor those who are obedient. And that's how God is. God has no favorites, but He favors those who are obedient. And that's how parents should be. They have no favorites, but they favor those who do what they're supposed to do. And when you think, well, you always do it, and some of my, my children would do this, well, you always do more for him than you do for him, or you always do more for him because they will be it. And they meet the requirements. And when they meet the requirements or the prerequisites or, or as we said before, the conditions, then they, they can come and ask daddy, daddy, can I go to the park? Can I go hang out with my friends? Sure, go ahead. When the other one comes, daddy, can I go to the park? No. Why? Because you never cleaned your room. You didn't pick up the trash. You talk back to your mama. No, you ain't going nowhere. Sit down. You ain't even watching TV. Click, turn it off. Will you let? Yes, I did. Why? Because that one did what they were supposed to do. So don't get that mad at God when you're doing something to hinder your prayers. And sometimes we get mad at God. Will you bless him so and so? Yes, I am, God says. I'm blessing her to, to, to get more, to have more, to get more peace, more patience, more, more kindness. I'm blessing them with more substance because they're obedient. And he says here, talking about this, once again, people who <clears throat> full of themselves. When Jesus told this parable, he says, two men went up to the temple to pray. Like I said, I'm going to paraphrase this. One stood up. Matter of fact, let me go and read it. It's, it's not that much. It says, the Pharisee, and the Pharisee was a religious man. What kind of man was he? A religious man. He was all caught up in his religion and in himself, and he thought he was better than everybody else. And this is what he said. He says, and the Pharisee stood praying thus with himself. Now, he mentions God, but he actually, he, 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 he's patting his own back. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men. I'm not an extortioner, unjust, I'm not an adulterer, even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, now watch this, verse 13. Now, first at verse 11 and 12, you see the Pharisee, he building his own self. See, the Bible says in the book of Romans, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Don't be all puffed up in yourself. And think of yourself more highly than y'all too. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that pride goes before destruction and a hearty spirit before a fall. You just set yourself for a train wreck. Set yourself up for a train wreck. Because God ain't hearing that when you are, 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 have the wrong attitude. And he says here, verse, verse 12, verse 13, and the publican standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, 
but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For very, for, for everyone that exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So when you, when you exalt yourself, God don't, in other words, God don't knock you down. But when you are, I said that, I said that wrong. When you build yourself up, when you puff yourself up, God's going to knock you down. But when you humble yourself, he's going to bless you. He's going to exalt you. Look over at James chapter 4 very quickly. James chapter 4. looking at that principle. And look with me at verse 6. And it says here, but he gives more grace. Wherefore he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. God gives grace. He gives mercy. He gives kindness. He gives his favor to those that are humble. He gives more grace, more favor, more and, and to, to those that are humble. Look with me at verse 10. So he says, now he gives us the instructions. So he says, humble yourselves in the mighty, in the sight of the Lord. Of the Lord. Humble yourself. We're in the sight of the Lord. Where is the sight of the Lord? <laughs> Everywhere you are. Because you're always in God's sight. He says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Didn't that echo what he said in, 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 in the book of Luke 18? He Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Submit yourself to God. Be obedient. And then, you know, the, but humble yourself. Don't be all puffed up. Don't be all puffed up in your own foolish pride. Don't think you're the big eye and everybody else is the little you. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Don't think of yourself of more importance than you ought to think of yourself. You are important to God. But don't build your own importance. Don't build your own importance. And the last principle that I wanted to talk about today of, of what things that can hinder your prayer. Because all of this deal with prayer. All of this deal with prayer. Because you do not want your prayers hindered. Now, there's one principle that I didn't put in here, but the Holy Spirit just put it on my heart before I go to the last one, is, is this. If you're here and you're married, and you're married, the Bible lets husband and wife know to be with one accord. Be on one accord. Both be seeking the Lord for your life. He says, because when you're not you hinder your prayers. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So you hinder your prayers. You hinder your, your prayers. We're not doing things. So between husband and wife, we don't be arguing and bickering amongst each other. Because when you're doing that, you're hindering your prayers. Because if you're arguing and bickering, you're both in the flesh. And God says, if you're in the flesh... It's, it's death. It's death. But when you're in the spirit, that's why he says walk in the spirit so you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. So when you're in the spirit and you're with one accord, then you, God's ears, once again, is intended to you. So that was a sidebar, and the Holy Spirit put that in my heart. And uh, Because somebody needed to hear that. I guess all of you did. But the last principle is worry, fear, and doubt. Worry, fear, and doubt. Now, a couple of, I, I, and I can preach on each and every one of those by themselves. And, and uh, um, y'all pretty, pretty much know I can and I have. But I, I put those three things together, worry, fear, and doubt, because worry, fear, and doubt works together, and they hinder your prayers. They hinder your prayers. Look with me at... at James chapter 1. Go to James chapter 1. Well, before you go to James chapter 1, go to Philippians chapter 4. 
Philippians chapter 4. We'll say amen when you get there. Philippians chapter 4. And look with me at verse 6. Are you there? Amen. Philippians chapter 4. And look what it says. Now in the King James it uses the word careful. It says be careful for nothing. Stop right there. Careful. The word careful also means don't be worried about anything. Don't be so burdened down in your mind that it's troubling you. It says, be careful or don't be worried about anything. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by what? Prayer. Prayer, Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. See, if you're worrying, don't pray. And if you're going to pray, don't worry. If you're worrying, because worry is a form of fear. And the Bible says, lets us know, in other words, where there is fear, there is no faith. Because fear and faith cannot operate in the same place at the same time in the same person. Cannot. You either be in faith or you're in fear, one or the other. And when you go to God in faith, trusting God and believing God, then put worry aside and trust God and turn it over to him. See, the, 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 the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, and you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to, going to quote it. It says, take no thought for your life. In other words, take no thought means another, another phrase for don't worry about your life. What you're going to put on, what you're going to eat, what you, you're going to wear, you know, how you're going to live. He said, don't, don't worry about those things. And then that's where he said, now seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Because if you're seeking God, God says, my God shall supply how much of your need? Oh. All of your need according to his riches and glory in and through Christ Jesus. So if you want your needs met by God, be obedient to God and then don't worry. See, well, well, well Pastor, what happens if I lose my job? God will get you another job. What happens if, 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 if things turn topsy-turvy and, and upside down and, and my car breaks down and my rent's due and, and my back is aching and my feet are too? You know, don't worry. God will take care of you because you're his and he's obligated to you. But if you're meeting the requirements, if you're seeking him first, seeking him first, seeking his face and not his hand, not his hand. That's why in that song that Sister Harrison mentioned this morning, you know, I'm not here for blessings. I just want to sit here at your feet. You know, if we're sitting here at his feet, if we're seeking him first, the blessings is coming with it. Even though we want God to bless us, we want God to take care of us, we want God to meet our needs according to his riches and glory in and through Christ Jesus our Lord, and he promises to do that. He says that we'll just observe to do all that is written therein, and don't look to the left nor look to the right. He said he'll cause our way to prosper and that we'll have good success. He says that. He said, I taught y'all this last week, he said it's the Father's good pleasure to give his children the kingdom. It's his pleasure to bless you. God is not trying to withhold anything from you, but when you're disobedient, when you're walking in sin, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're doing things with the wrong motives, and then when, you, when you're worried, because worry is doubt. That's why I couple those together. Worry and fear cause doubt. Now go to James. Go to James. Chapter 1. And look what he says at verse 6 and 7. And we're about to close. Because God wants you to know what things hinder your prayers so you can avoid doing those things. And that you can walk up right before God. And then you can go to God in confidence. He says, when you come to God, he says, but let him ask how in faith Nothing wavering. In other words, it's saying not doubting. How do you know that this word means not doubting? Watch what it went on to say. Nothing wavering in the King James. It says, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed with the wind. Verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. 
And then he went on to say, a double-minded man is unstable in how many of his ways? Oh. All of his ways. When you're double-minded, when you're doubtful, when you're full of worry, when you're full of fear, it causes doubt. And when you doubt God, see, that's why in, in, in Mark chapter, chapter 11, it says, have faith in God. Then you can say to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in your heart, but believe those things which you say shall come to pass and you will have whatsoever you say. Therefore I say unto you that, that when you pray, believe that you receive it and you'll have it. As a matter of fact, he says, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, now you can come to God with your desires, when you meet the prerequisites, when you meet the conditions of God, when you come to God like he wants you to come to him and not in your own way. Because guess what? If one of my children came to me with attitude and then they asked me for something, it's like <laughs> go think about that. Then come back. Then come back. And me as a man, if I'll do that, how much more will God do that? We want to have that confidence that I spoke about in, in 1 John chapter 5. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask him anything according to his will, he hears us. You want to know that your loving, caring, sharing Heavenly Father hears you. You want to know that he hears you. He's not a man. That, that when you're daddy, 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 and daddy's ignoring you, then he's telling you, go on, get out of my face, I'm watching TV. Daddy, daddy, and you keep asking and daddy's not responding. And then when you do respond, he responds without you. Child, what you want? God is not like that. When you speak, God is listening. He said, when you come right, the Bible says, and I showed you this. I showed you this in, 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 in 2 Chronicles. He said, then will I incline my ear. When you come right, he inclines his ear. He, he says, yes, baby. What do you want daddy to do, baby? Because when you're doing good, when you're doing right, the Bible says, and I read this last week, I will hold no good thing from you when you're doing right. Nothing. You come to me right. I won't withhold it from you. Whatever you need. It's there for you. It's there for you. Whatever you need. And I know you're not going to come to me with some foolishness. Because the Bible says the desires of the righteous is only pure. When you do it right, you're not going to come to me with no foolishness. With lies. Daddy, give me some money. I want to go to the movies, but yet you're trying to go somewhere you're not supposed to go. Daddy, let me use your car. Uh, 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 I need to go to the store, but yet you end up somewhere you wasn't supposed to be. No. The Bible says the desires of the righteous is only good. You want to always do what's right in the eyesight of your father. When I was growing up, and, I, and, and forgive me, because I was a sinner, but I still always tried to please my mother. Even though I did some wrong things, and, but I never wanted my mother, I always wanted to please my mother. Always wanted to please my mother. Now because I was a sinner, I wasn't good at pleasing my mother. We are to always want to please God and do what's right in his eyes and not do these, these things that I've mentioned. Once again, coming to him with sin in your life. Coming to him with the wrong motives. Coming to him with pride and self-interest. Coming to him with worry, fear, and doubt. You should never come to him. Come to him knowing that he's your loving, caring, sharing Heavenly Father. And it's his good pleasure to bless you and give you everything you need. And even a bit of what you want. Because he knows what
what you want. You ain't gonna want nothing that's bad for you or that's wrong for you when you come to him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.